the whole conference will be about participation on all levels, on all types of society and all forms of inclusion. And this includes the top, it includes the leadership. And that's why we're discussing participation, disability and leadership at the, right, at the very beginning of this conference. And I'm glad to um, have such a, a distinguished but also diverse um, panel here sitting with me. Um, you already know about uh, Jenny Lefleur. I'm not going to introduce her anymore, but I'm going to introduce to you, to you Tori and Janet Aderemi. She's a disability inclusion consultant and researcher and also winner of the first Her Abilities Award 2019 from Nigeria. And also welcome to Mr. Yoav Krayem. He's an advocate for the rights of people with disabilities. He's an Henry Riscardi Achievement Awardee from Israel. So welcome the three of you here on the couch. So the idea of this next minutes is uh, to give the three of um, my, my three panelists an opportunity to present who they are, what they work for, and uh, leading to um, a discussion here on the couch about participation and leadership. Your ideas, your thoughts, your impressions, your experiences, and what you want to share about being, with, uh, this, being a person with a disability and being in a leadership role and sharing this with, with all of us, uh, ideas, whatever you want to share. Um, Toin, I would like to start with you. Uh, please give us your story and uh, finalizing in probably some four or five minutes with uh, what's your experience, what's your idea about leadership? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, like uh, Michael already said, I'm Toin Aderemi. I'm from Nigeria. I am a disability inclusion consultant. I trained as a pharmacist to start with. Then later I went into public health and that was because I, I identified a gap when I was interning somewhere, uh, whereby I discovered that they were not including women and girls with disabilities in sexual and reproductive health. And that was what spurred my uh, interest in disability inclusive development work. Uh, over the years, I had worked with um, some international NGOs uh, in both advisory and leadership positions. And I would say that um, I've discovered that participation of persons with disabilities is a right. And like we already also know, that it is one of the key principles of the UNCRPD. Although many stakeholders do believe that they don't need to include persons with disabilities, of course they give excuses, some misconceptions. At times they believe, well, they are too weak, they don't know what we're going to be discussing. Uh, but I feel that rather they should create opportunities for persons with disabilities to be involved, to participate in whatever program they are putting up. Uh, for example, uh, we had to intervene sometime last year in Nigeria with the Shivni scholarship by the British government. Uh, I had a colleague who is also a person with disability and he happened to be our disability inclusion advisor when I was a country representative for CBM in Nigeria. And he happened to be the only person, the only person with disability that ever gotten that in Nigeria. And then we discovered that it was based on the fact that they were giving it to only elites. And from our experience in Nigeria, most persons with disabilities may not fall into that category. So then we had to intervene that they shouldn't base their selection only on being an elite. Because an average person with disability in Nigeria may not fall into that category. And we're able to intervene so that eventually we had about five persons with disabilities who got the scholarship. And to me, uh, that was a very good example of creating opportunities. Apart from creating opportunities for this category of people to participate, uh, we should also uh, 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 remove barriers. People may want to attend programs, they may want to participate in a particular section, and when there are bar barriers to their participation, of course, they cannot do that. And um, lastly, disability inclusion is a political issue because it involves resource allocation. And being a leader, 
been exposed to participate in programs that, are, that can build one's capacity, that can equip somebody with our skills for leadership, and the person becoming a leader uh, would really place such a person with disability in the position, of course, to advocate in disability inclusion and to also make sure that resource allocation uh, prioritizes disability inclusion. Uh, this also happened to me some time ago in that I had to, of course, I know the issues because I'm a person with disability. I have the skills. I know the issues. I have my networks. And through my networks, I could also uh, glean information from others to know what the situation is. And of course, to uh, allocate resources, to allocate funding to particular issues so that we can also uh, make sure that enough persons with disabilities are able to participate. And so I've discovered that when people can participate, they build their leadership skills. And when they are leaders, they are able to intervene more. The person participates more and also uh, uh, widen the horizon for others to also participate. So let me stop there for now. Um, thank you, Twain. Um, before I forget, and I have forgotten it already, uh, you also get a glimpse of graphic facilitation that we provide at the conference. So there's Petra Plitschke to my right here, who is doing already some, some, some work on making uh, this visible, what we are discussing here. So if you want to more, know more, see more, she's working on, the, on my right-hand side, she's, and she will stay there, and also her graphics will stay there. You can also have a look afterwards. Over to you, Joam. Um, please give us your background, where do you come from, and what's your approach to participation and, and, and leadership? Okay, first of all, let me thank you for inviting me, and apologize to you, all, all the audience, on my very basic English. I hope that I will, I will succeed in provide all my ideas. If I, there is enough Israelis in the audience, so if I forget a word, I will try to it in Hebrew and you tell it back and it would be all right. Um, um, okay, my, my, my story began when I was uh, 15 years old. I, wore, I uh, learned in a special school and I wanted to integrated in a regular school and because I have not only physical dis disability, also uh, uh, learning disabilities, some of the experts said that I can't. And it required a fight that my parents did and I joined them on, on my rights to be included in a regular school. Um, after I was a, a success in inclusion, sorry, I'm not modest, um, um, the system started ta taking me as an example. You see what we do for him, he, he can integrate it, and then that was the point that I decided that I'm not special, and I just have the opportunity, and if my success have any meaning at all, it should, be, it should mean that nobody have to fight the fight that I needed to anymore. Um, then I was invited through one of the organizations in Israel called Ilan, to be a representative on our national uh, health insurance law. Um, and I, I went, although I was a kid and I didn't know much about it, but I wanted to, make, to meet parliament members and to talk to them about education. So I went on the opportunity that I got and since then, I met the founder of Bishkut in the Knesset, who worked on the equal uh, rights law for disabled people. And since then, I, was, I, I am an activist in that area. But 
in the last uh, 10 years, I have the privilege not only to be one of the voices of the community of disabled people in Israel, but to facilitate to others, to help others to raise their voice. And uh, one project that I'm very much proud to manage in Bet Easy Shapira, and we're doing it with partnership with Elvin Israel, and we were founded uh, to the generosity of the uh, Roderman Family uh, Foundation um, called Self Advocacy for People with Intellectual Disability. Because there is population in the community of disability that their voice uh, means even less than others. And, and you say about them, they cannot think and they cannot speak and they cannot understand. And we really need to understand that they, that they understand differently. We need to be willing to uh, really carefully listen. And we, we first of all need to tell them that they have some things to say and we are willing and we are obligated to hear them. And, and, and this process of getting out of oppression, it's a very, very long journey because people learn that they don't matter and they start, stop dreaming, stop wanting, stop believing them, themselves. And we need to convince them that to start dream, to, to, to start to dream again is not with a big price that they cannot pay. Thank you. I think you both deserve a warm applause at this stage. <laughs> Jenny. Uh, so I'll keep it short. I've already spoken a lot. Um, but I do think, if I think back and reflect back on my own personal journey, um, I, I came out of music school with, as a classical clarinetist, quite a bad one. Um, and I knew I was going to be broke. Um, and so got a job in IT. Uh, I actually worked at the Daily Mirror uh, under Piers Morgan, if anyone remembers him. Um, I will move on. Um, I, and I think that the overall journey I've had, at least in the workplace, uh, is I didn't, you know, my, my deafness was declining um, and it hadn't reached severe profound at that point. I'm, I'm considerably older now. Um, but I, I think I, I wasn't a good self-advocate. If I listen to both of you, it, it, you know, so much of what you're doing is constantly, consistently educating, driving, bringing the right people to the table. And I think one of the responsibilities that we have, although I wish it was less, is to educate everybody around. Um, I reached the point in my career many, many moons ago where I was offered a job but knew that I wouldn't be able to do the job uh, because of my deafness, and I, I tried to resign. And I, I was very fortunate to have, uh, I, I was a participant in a UK government scheme at the time, a great manager, a great company, uh, that helped to find me digital hearing aids and find me accommodations and find me what I needed to be included in the workplace and then got educated on everything else to be more included as I was really getting to the point where I couldn't use the phone. There was so much out there that I didn't know. And then, so I think there is this responsibility opportunity uh, for us to continually, we've all got to be better self-advocates. And I know some of you are incredible at that, but it is the most important skill. I, I have to do it even today. Uh, I had a doctor's appointment recently and they hadn't organized, a, they hadn't organized an interpreter and couldn't find one um, and wanted to proceed without it. And it was one of those appointments that I actually needed to understand what was being said, um, uh, as you do with medical appointments. Um, and it was a very tough situation to be in because you're with people that do not understand. Uh, my speech is good, really good, um, and it's deceptively 
Uh, so, so I think we have responsibility to educate. We have a responsibility as companies to be transparent about accessibility features, what can be used, how to get them. The more information that I think authorities, governments, public policy, private companies can put out, the, it needs to be there. Um, and it needs to be there now ever more so uh, to ensure participation of all. And then I think we've got to think creatively. Um, I want to see more, selfishly for me, more direct video so that I can call uh, using sign language and speak to someone in sign language. Um, I'd much rather do that than speak through, I love my interpreter, I love you, but speak through my interpreter um, or speak using a relay service. And I know that most of those services are not available around the world. I'm in a very privileged position um, with where I live. So I, I think there's more opportunity, more responsibility we have to open the inclusion uh, and prevent these barriers. Um, thank you, Jenny. Um, thank you. <laughs> well, there, listening to you, um, we might, and I think it's a, an, an easy question to ask, but uh, more, probably more difficult to answer. If you look at your success and how you did it and what success and what was not, um, we could find two groups of strategies to make yourselves heard. One is to find peers and create networks and create bigger and then you speak as a group and you're getting more gravity and you're getting more um, yeah, more uh, clout and there's still more going on and, you, and, and so you're, you're creating influence. That would be one strategy. So this more, let's say the bottom up strategy, creating networks of peers. The other one would be, and you also mentioned, it's going straight to the top. You're going to the parliamentarians, you're going to the business leaders, you're going to the ministers, you're going to the UN and trying to influence them directly at the top. I know this is an easy question to answer. What's, what's your suggestion? What works for you? Is it a combination of both? How, what, what would you see what's, what's, what's more successful? Uh, I would say it's, it's a combination. Uh, if, 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 if you are going to reach everybody effectively, then you have to use a combination of uh, strategies. Uh, of course, especially in most of our developing countries, the development partners are key because they influence whatever happens in the country. So we have to engage them to prioritize disability inclusion. At the same time, we have to work with our peers and another great thing that I have seen that works is also to, uh, as much as possible, showcase what is possible. If, as a person with disability, you receive the right support. Because most often people just write people off that, well, they cannot do anything. But of course they can if those barriers are removed. If they have the right support, if every stakeholder is able to put the right thing in place, then everybody can thrive. Thank you. Thank you. you have? Well, we actually have to do both constantly and uh, because we have to uh, influence policy makers work daily day and we have to be a larger group and, and raise a voice. And we, we also have to work with our peer groups to uh, be a model, to, to be a model of, of leadership in order to uh, more people uh, re, uh, coming forward and speak their mind and, and to, to show it's possible. When, and we also need to uh, erase the prejudice that uh, one group of disability have on the other one, because this is a very sad political issue within the community of disability. And, and as long as we fight not uh, all together, but uh, groups against groups against groups, uh, we, we are weakening ourselves as a, as a community, as a public, and I also want to say that I think we need to get to the next level and stop and not only talk, not stop, but not only talk on, on uh, nothing about us without us, 
because everything is about us, because we have fu fully citizenship in our countries, and every policy is also about us, and we need to educate the public and the policymaker that they should consider uh, disabled citizens in every decision that they're making. Thank you. Okay, um, let, let's uh, start a fun round of, uh, of questions to the, to the three of you. Um, if you would have to choose one recommendation, one suggestion of bringing more people with disabilities into decision-making positions, into leadership, what would be that recommendation? You said more support. Uh, is, would this be the, the, the one or is, does something else come to your mind? Uh, well, what I would say is still uh, a bit related. We need to open up the space to accommodate more person with disabilities in leadership positions. Because we do have cases where uh, a person with disability is qualified. And for the main fact that this person has a disability, the authority would say, no, he or she cannot do it. And that's not going to help us. It's not going to help anybody at all, including the society, including the policymakers, including the development uh, partners. So we, we need to open up the space, more advocacy, more commitment from the different stakeholders so that we can have more person with disabilities in leadership positions to effect more changes. Thank you. You've well, we have to do, I think the accommodation is, uh, is the first um, condition, but it's not enough. We need really to uh, help uh, uh, people with disability to recognize their abilities. And, and maybe we can start talking about a variety of, the, of, of abilities instead of disabilities. Um, and because we need to understand that people with disability defined but what they can't do. And this definition is really oppressive. And so we, we, we need each of every one of us to take a long journey to, to be free of that and to really know that we can do. We can start talking about different kind of abilities and we can uh, start festive the diversity of people uh, and, and, and start to recognize the, the uh, strength and the ability that not come although we are disabled, uh, but within the disability. What our experience, what our, our uh, life experience give us and not only what they taking from us and, and what barrier we should, we should uh, remove. We should remove the barriers, but we should festive the uh, abilities and, and we should look up for them when all of the surrounding starting by, defini by the definition of what we can't do. Thank you. must remember to turn things on. I am technical, you know. Um, so I went to the National Association of the Deaf Conference um, just over a year ago, and this is an American organization, and they told me that I was the first deaf person in the C-suite of a private company in the FTSE 500. And, uh, and they were very excited, um, and I was mortified. Uh, there should be more people with disabilities in leadership positions, whether it is a public, a private, uh, or a policy role. We need more people with disabilities, more cool, sassy, intelligent, smart, amazing individuals in leadership roles. 
I have been so fortunate to be given the chance that I've been given. But I think these two are great examples of leaders that should be in these positions um, and should be informing us and informing every dignitary. And if you're out there, hire someone, just hire someone, fix the processes and make it happen because then you have people with that experience, with that understanding, with those connections, networks, advocacy, and um, I'll slow down, apologies. I get, I, I, but just hire talent with disabilities, hire talent and promote talent. It is the most important thing we can do. I mean, all of you guys. Thank you. Well, thanks to the three of you. Uh, we